Today on The Grave Talks, The Other Side, with Timothy Shaw. Timothy Shaw grew up surrounded by spirituality. The concept of there being another side to our dimension was not a foreign one. Communicating with deceased loved ones and the dead were common practices among his family. As Tim grew older, he would learn that the ability to communicate with the dead was a skill that he could focus on, and in his own way, be a bridge for messages from the dead to the living. Today on The Grave Talks, we hear about the story and experiences of Timothy Shaw. You know, spiritualism has been in my family since the 1880s. So uh, I was actually brought up going to visit my spiritualist relatives in the Lilydale Assembly, which is a uh, spiritualist community in Western New York. And uh, I've had mediums in my family for years. So uh, it's always been really there. It's always been very natural. You know, I had uncles that read cards and uh, back in when I was a kid, and we're talking like nine, ten years old, back in '72 or '73, mm-hmm. I got a chance to go out, get out there, and experience some really great stuff. But I will admit that uh, I know it's hard to believe, but I was quite the hellion back there. And at, ni- at the age of nine and ten, of course, we were cause all sorts of havoc down in the community. So on Sundays, our parents, you know, uh, uh, my parents, and you know the. The, the people down there, their their parents decided to enroll us in Lyceum, which is a spiritualist Sunday school. Mm-hmm. And I got to tell you what, I was brought up Roman Catholic and went through all the rights of being, you know, all the living rights of being a Roman Catholic. And somehow the spiritualist community really stuck. The spiritualist religion really stuck. And I went to a a parochial school, which was like a laugh a minute. And I had I I had a nun. I had a nun that went and uh, asked us when I was in eighth grade, what did you do on your summer vacation? Well, you know what? I mean, everybody else is writing about, oh, we went swimming. We went here. We went there. I wrote, we used to go down to visit my relatives down in the Lilydale Assembly. And I got the chance to, I got a chance to hear somebody uh, speaking without, without moving their lips. I got a chance to, 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 uh, get a message from my great great grandfather at the at at the inspiration stump I, I got a chance to go for meditation and needless to say everybody else you know they everybody got their little papers and everybody got like their C's and B's and I thought I I, I thought I was Ralphie in the Christmas story because I thought that I was going to get this a plus you know this is going to be a great thing that I did in a summer vacation <laughs> and instead of getting my paper I got a note that said uh Please give this to your parents. And basically it was, Mr. and Mrs. Shaw, we have to have a, a meeting as soon as possible. And we did. And, they, and, you know, my parents had, you know, went in there and my father explained everything to her. And uh, basically what she said was, OK, it's a religion. We understand that. But do us a favor. Tell Tim not to be talking about it to his schoolmates and stuff. So my father came back. And he was pretty stern. He said, hey cut that stuff out, man. You got, you can't be talking about that. Not least in this school. Wait till you get to high school. (laughs) Well, immediate, you know what? Immediately I went out and I started telling all my friends what I would, what we were doing and stuff. So I really have, I mean, I guess, you know, the paranormal kind of walks hand in hand with spiritualism. So I've been influenced by this for years. I mean, uh, when I was in high school, I took part in uh, uh, spirit rescue service uh, circles, which, you know, it's what they call like, you know, trying to go and uh, release the spirit onto, you know, to go back, go wherever it goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was back, you know, I'm talking 14, 15 years old when that stuff happened. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I continued right up, kind of chipping at it, not getting very, very serious until about 82 when I actively saw something in 
you know, the, the house I was living in up until that time, I'd gone to seances and nothing really bothered me, but this was the first time I'd ever seen like a full bodied apparition, you know, it's like, Whoa, and kind of freaked me for a few years and I didn't do anything. And, you know, they always say when the time is right, the time is right. And I slowly came back to it. And I, I would say by like 85, 86, I don't think I, I don't think I've slowed down since. <laughs> sure. Let me ask you leading up to, to 82, when you had that experience and you saw something, um, and you had been brought up in, in a very spiritualist family, a very spiritualist world and, and surrounding, and then also had the parochial side of it as well. Uh, both, at the same time, uh, complimenting and contradicting. I understand how that that totally works sometimes with with the two. Um, what was it without having a a physical experience or seeing something in front of you like you did in in eighty two? What was it that that kept your interest, kept you, um, you know, believing in in this world of of stuff without having, uh, I guess, a, a ghostly experience or something that really physically came to you and, and you saw, oh my God, this is real. Basically, it was the intrinsic feeling that it was right. Okay. You know, it's one of those things where people like are, you know, they kind of wander, they kind of search their whole lives for something to find that, that, uh, to get that square peg in the square hole type sure. deal. And I got to tell you, uh, what I was being taught, and again, we're talking the 1970s, you know, uh, we're talking Vatican II. We're talking the uh, uh, demystification of the of the Roman Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and it felt so hollow to me. It felt hollow. It felt as if it was just a cardboard cutout for a religion. Yeah. And again, I mean, I know now that it's a great religion, and I understand how. I mean, both religions, spiritualism and Catholicism, actually mesh together. I mean, sure. they're 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 more uh, uh, positives and negatives mm -hmm. between the two. And you know what? They're so similar. But at that time, the way it was being taught to me was hollow. It was like, you know, it was like I was being talked down to. And again, that was 1970s, the way they did things. Sure. At, you know, when I when I went to Lyceum and I went to the spiritualist churches and, and, and that sort of thing, and I went to all the children's activities, it felt as if we were being spoke to. And that made a big difference back then. It really did. And they believed that they wanted to cultivate uh, young minds and and bring these bring kids into the belief system, but however, spiritualism is not a religion of conversion. It's a religion of conviction. So if you didn't like it and it was it scared you or if it didn't mesh, no problem. There was no no harm, no foul. You know, do whatever you got to do to go wherever you want to go. But for me, it just felt right, right from the beginning. I my uncle used to tell my great uncle used to tell me all sorts of stories. And, uh, you know, Civil War relatives and, and you know, the old ways. And, the, and he's, again, he was a card reader. And he actually foretold an accident where his one of his daughters was actually killed in it. And, you know, he used to tell me that story and, and show me different things. Uh, I had a great aunt that used to see uh, people in her bedroom and, and used to, you know, commune with different spirits, you know, passively, not as a profession, but passively. So these were things that really, you know, right from an early age just seemed to just make so much perfect sense to me. Sure. And when you have people who you, you love and you trust are they're telling you their accounts and they're not giving it to you in, in the line of a, a tall tale. But just facts of life. This is how it works. This is how it works for us. You're going to accept that and you're going to believe that uh, more than, than a complete stranger sharing something with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the one thing, again, I want to reiterate is the fact that I went to a uh, I went to a lecture uh, by the past president of the National Spiritual Association of Churches. She married a former Jesuit theologian and he had taught at Georgetown University. At that point, I realized that all belief systems are so interconnected. It is, it's, it's mind blowing. It was an epiphany and outside of the divinity of Jesus Christ, uh, there really wasn't that much of a difference. I'll tell you what the, I'll tell you what the big difference is. It's what they call things, you know, by location and all that. The church has a certain way of saying it. Spiritualists and other, you know, uh, metaphysical religions, they have a way of saying it. But it all means the same thing. Yeah. It all means the same thing. And that, to me, really put 
it right on the table for me. And that's why I, you know, I always tell people whenever I speak, don't throw a baby out with the bathwater. Don't condemn Christianity. Don't condemn all this stuff because the basic dogma is just like any other dogma. It all is there. It's man that corrupts it in order to go and control or keep that sect or religion going. So always look at the basics and research it for yourself because when you do, you find the beauty of it and the way you wish it had been taught when you were a kid. I know at least, I'll be honest with you, be totally honest with you. If I had been taught Roman Catholicism the way I now understand it and the way I, you know, the way that, you know, other people have taught me and, and friends of mine who are in clergy, I probably would never have gone into the spiritualist religion. I would have stayed a Roman Catholic because of the fact it's so beautiful and you have, you know, all the divination of saints and you have all this stuff that's there. And the most poignant thing that anybody ever told me was this judge, this former Jesuit looked at me one day and he said, listen, Tim, I'm going to tell you something. What you're going to see is that there is no division in what we do. Spirituality is spirituality. It all works the same. It's just that you have to find it for yourself. So go out there and explore. And I mean, I have Pentecostal friends that that we go and we discuss the Bible and Mormon friends because I've read a good chunk of the Book of Mormon. Uh, You know, we, we go and we you know, we discuss these things. And that's what's beautiful about what we do. I love that. Mm -hmm. Take us to 1982 and the experience that you had where you saw something, where there was something, an incident that occurred that that took it beyond just faith and a belief system, but a putting it almost somewhat in stone in front of you of, hey, there is definitely something here. and, And here it is for your own eyes. Well, that's, I always laugh at this one because up until this point, I had seen shadows and we had done children's seances and and adult seances and all this other stuff. And I felt the room get cold Mm -hmm. and I've, you know, I was used to that stuff. I was used to all the little hallmarks of a haunting, you know? So I had, I was in college and we went and, uh, uh, they had a a Siddhara isolation tank on the campus and if anybody doesn't know what they are, uh, if you watch the cult classic Altered States, the very last isolation tank that that uh, William Hurt goes into, that's a Sitar isolation tank. Well, I had logged, I don't even know how many hours. Oh, my God. You know, like in one and two hour increments, I probably logged between 50 to 70 hours in this thing. And everyone was start every, you know, every time I went in, it was getting more and more intense. It was getting to the point where I, at, at this time, and we're talking before morphing technology, you know, I could see with my eyes open, faces morphing into each other. Uh, and it just got, it start, the whole feeling started to get very intense. Well, I had done that and I was uh, planning to get married. So I was saving some money and uh, living with my parents up on, you know, I was living up in their second floor apartment. And I'm laying in bed and I just started falling asleep and I was running a night crew in a supermarket at the time to make money and when I fell asleep it felt like my eyes just exploded and I could see all these little stars that that was amazing and I thought oh hey this is pretty cool so it kind of jarred me and I woke up and I'm sitting on the edge of my bed and I saw an entity or whatever you want to call it Mm -hmm. walk past the bedroom door slowly and I went wow i got out there and checked all the windows were shut there was nothing out there the feeling was overwhelmingly sweet it was peaceful and i said to myself wow i finally saw my first full-bodied apparition this is phenomenal i did you know and i just thought it was the greatest thing and then i went to sleep <laughs> you know it's like six <laughs> o'clock at night i mean i seen it though i saw it during the day six o'clock at night i'm sleeping i woke up do you know what my logical mind had clicked in And by the time I went to work, I was freaked. Mm -hmm. And that's what drove it home. And I stopped because I I don't believe my maturity level was up enough to be able to go and, and, you know, really take the whole concept in. Also, at that time, I kept thinking, I was, I thought I was, you know, the best thing since sliced bread. And I'm thinking, I want this. I want to be able to see this. I want to be this medium. I want all this. I want to be able to experience all this stuff. 
be careful what you wish for because you may surely get it. And I got it in spades. It was so hardcore. And it took me a while. And I always say, you know, sometimes your maturity level has to be able to go and kind of catch up with you. And that's exactly what happened. And, and to bring me back into it, uh, I had been studying like Reiki healing and I had been doing a lot of work with shamans and uh, 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 Native American life ways, flint napping and, and, nat- and, and natural awareness training and that sort of thing. But I'd never really gotten too involved with the mediumship portion. And one day I was at a Reiki share. And we were doing laying the hands on and all of a sudden just it just started flowing. Everything just flowed. And that told me the experience told me that everything is interconnected and you don't have to be you don't have to be afraid of it. It's just what it is. And if you decide and put that intent out that you want to do it slowly by steps, the universe works with you. And that's what I did. I put that I whenever I felt I was starting to advance way too quickly I just put the brakes on, said, hey, I don't know if I can handle this. Let's just take a break. I took a couple breaths in there and slowly developed into kind of where I am now, which is like scary to me just to think about Mm -hmm. it. (laughs) It's interesting because a lot of times when when you talk about mediumship or or someone who is sensitive uh, or empathic, it's thought of, well, this is just how they're born and this is the gift that they have. It's almost like... Uh, the way sometimes I describe it, like eyesight. Uh, you know, sometimes you have great eyesight. Sometimes you can hear certain tones that that others can't. It's it's just the gifts that you're given, um, and and sometimes that's the view. It's it's either you have it or you don't. But from what I'm understanding from you, this is is a it's a gift. It's a it's more of a skill than it is. Uh, a sense, whereas I can't improve my mm-hmm. eyesight if I want to, no matter what I do, glasses are the only option. Um, it, it's not like I'm going to suddenly get better vision by learning how to see better. But with something like this and being sensitive, is this something that is essentially a skill that can be improved upon and, and essentially open yourself up to new levels of feeling these things by study and learning about it? Absolutely. Absolutely. When we were in that hunter gatherer stage, we needed that step up in order to survive. We had to know where warring tri- other warring tribes were. We had to go and and get out there and figure out where the, you know, clear water was and shelter and, and herds and, and that sort of thing. We needed that step. And as we uh, as, as as a society, as as the human race began to go and wall itself up and become more agricultural, we didn't need that. The only people that possessed that were like shaman and medicine men and holy men and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Everybody, everybody has it in some degree. Everybody has it. It's like muscle memory. All you do, you know, all you have to do is have the desire to actually redevelop it. And it comes back. Mm-hmm. And as a gift, I don't consider it a gift. It's not a gift. It's an ability. We mm-hmm. have, It's just a sense that we all have. Anybody can do it. It depends on uh, how you develop because everybody's different mentally, physically. Everything is different. Everything has to be taken into consideration. Some people have clear feeling, clear ascension. That is just like, man, you know, they're just like unbelievable. They can feel these vibes and everything out there. It's emotions. They, they can catch it. Other people can catch a little bit of it, but they can, you know, they can have the visuals in their heads or or they can hear and smell things. You know, it all depends. So what you do is you develop what you have first. And if it fits and you are not afraid of it and you're comfortable with it, then you can start slowly adding more tools to slowly and just and the big thing is is people have to have patience you know i mean i people go well how come you do x y and z i said well i started when i was like nine or ten years old Mm -hmm. that makes a big difference whereas you know you know you can't do this overnight you can you know you can develop to a certain degree but it just takes time and then you also have to have the intent you really have to want it Mm-hmm. And that's something that a lot of people in this society, they, you know, they, they want to be pablum fed and, you know, they just, they don't, they don't have that, uh, as a society, we don't have the patience to learn anymore. Mm-hmm. It, 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 uh, help me understand what exactly it is that, that you developed as, as this, this skill, this mediumship grew and, and you had the patience to, to take the time to develop it. What was occurring around you? What were you noticing 
different prior to you going down that path? You notice everything. Okay. <laughs> That's the only sure. way I can describe <laughs> it. You know, it's uh, the difference. And I always tell students, you know, when they, when they come to me for classes or we, you know, somebody has a problem. I said the difference between everybody else and mediums and psychics is that we notice things a little more intense intensely. I mean, we really do. And uh, it's not what we're, I'm not talking about cold reading, which, you know, that's that's a you know, that's just a carny trick. Mm -hmm. But true mediumship, you learn over time everything, the nuances of thought and the vibrations. And all of a sudden these vibrations start making sense in your head, you know, and it's it's just all very, very small little things. And uh, I mean, I always uh, liked being out in the woods and that was that was a real big thing for me. And my study of natural awareness actually took me, I, I would say it took me to a, 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 a plateau that enabled me to be able to go and step more comfortably in the mediumship because of the fact that when you're out in the woods you become hyper aware you're just not aware of your your surroundings you become hyper aware you'll be sleeping and all of a sudden you'll wake up and you won't hear anything but you know that there's something there it's a knowing it's it's that it's that sixth sense that's coming in you know that you know you're you know the danger that's coming in or there's there's a uh, uh, an animal within that perimeter that of where you're of where maybe perhaps where you're sleeping or where your camp is uh, you start you know, you know, you may use a compass, but sometimes you follow your own instinct and you can get to A to B quicker than going and, you know, worrying about, you know, following the trail. So that really was what was happening as a kid. And, you know, as I just kind of stepped away from uh, the mediumship and all the, you know, the study of metaphysics for, for a little while. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, it just it became natural. Again, the best way I can describe anything is that it is natural. Mm -hmm. It just feels so natural. And when you feel that way, it's so easy to follow it. Sure. You said that you had, had kind of put the brakes on it a little bit while you're trying to just get a grip, essentially, on, on what was going on, on, on these new uh, you know, abilities, these new skills that you had developed before you were ready to take that, that next step forward. Uh, once you continue to take those steps forward, is an individual able to ever turn that off or digress? Or once that door is open, is it always open? Always open. Okay. Always open. I learned to ignore more than anything else. I've learned, and and if you hear if you hear barking, that's my that's You're my fine. brave watchdog Labrador <laughs> Win, Winifred that's uh, that's barking at my neighbor next door, and everything is hollow downstairs, so it's echoing. So I apologize for that. <laughs> fine, but uh, yeah, I you I I train myself to ignore things. You do you'll never shut it down. Mm -hmm. You'll never shut it down. Once the door is open, it's always open. So uh, you know, I've I've worked with people that cannot go and can't. They, I mean, seriously, they can't go shopping. They can't go anywhere during the day when there's a lot of people around mm -hmm. because they feel overwhelmed. And that's not a way to live. You have to be able if you're going to do this work, you got to work within the people. you got to be part of the people. So you go out there and you learn how to do this. You learn how to work with it. And, you know, you're standing in a bank line and you get that ick feeling from somebody in front of you. What are you going to do? Run away? That's not living in the human race. You've got to live in the human race. So that's a skill that you kind of develop. You know, some people do it naturally. Other people need to go and, and have classes to do it. But it's the ignoring of reality sometimes, which is the psychic part of us. Mm -hmm. uh, that's so important. Sure. When individuals sometimes view or try to understand what it is, someone like yourself is feeling uh the, sometimes they jump to oh they see dead people um you know th that's the the quick go-to uh but I I explain to us what it, it really is for you is it more so about being able to for example standing in the bank line you're picking up on the emotions the good the bad the baggage whatever it may be good bags bad bags on that individual that's in front of you uh or is it a combination of that feeling the emotional connection to those around you and picking up on spirits that may be around as well what exactly is it that you're experiencing to me, everything is energy. Okay. Everything is energy. Everything is vibration. Everything is frequency. You know, I I just had this conversation the other day with somebody. I sort of depersonalized 
spirit. When I think of spirit, I don't think of like a celestial body with wings or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I think of them as pure energy. I believe that thoughts are things we're taught that right from, you know, young, since as kids we're taught thoughts are things. Always remember that how you think is how you are. So for me, since everything's in a vibratory state, the slower it vibrates, we can see it and experience it, the quicker it is we can't. Uh, I believe that that's what we're picking up. And we train ourselves to pick up what we need and how we work. Uh, when I'm out there in, you know, with everybody, sure, I can pick stuff up from the person in front of me. Sure, I can feel something that's going on. But as time goes on, you've got to be very careful and adamant that you're not going to go and just be overwhelmed by all this energy. And I see when I say energy, it's like the essence of the personality, essence of the ego, the soul, whatever you want to call it. All of these, all of these entities want to speak to you. They want to get their message across. They, you know, they always say spirit hungers for human interconnection. And that is to me is is important. But you have to be able to go, and again, you train yourself, you focus yourself so that it doesn't become disruptive and it works on your timetable. Uh, when I was during the unfoldment process, <laughs> when I was, you know, my poor wife, she, I don't know how she even stands me because the stuff that, that you know, either I bring into the house or where I'm doing with the stuff I'm doing, uh, most wives would just like get out, you know. <laughs> uh, when I was going through the enfoldment process, which is the hardcore uh, process of becoming a medium where it really is, you know, you're working a lot. Two, three o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden I'd wake up and I'd see somebody in the bedroom mm -hmm. as real as, as us. Mm -hmm. And the one night I sat up on my, on my bed and I started talking and my wife, now I don't remember a lot of this, but my wife, my wife said, who the hell are you talking to? And I said, uh, you know, this woman here. And I remember that she had this like deep green vet, uh, green dress on and dark hair. And I was carrying on this whole conversation with her. And she goes, what? I said, yeah, she's dead. And she goes, in this bedroom, in this room? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And she says, at that, I just got right set, you know, just rolled right in the back in the bed and put the blankets up and, and fell back asleep. And meanwhile, she's in a, she's covered up in a, you know, in a fetal position with the blanket over her head, you mm -hmm. know, but but that's what happened when it gets that intense. When we first got married, we were in the Bahamas on our honeymoon. And I saw people in the bedroom and scared the hell out of her when I was yelling, get out of the room and all this stuff. So uh, you really, you know, a, a lot of what we do is, is, is a lot of cognitive training. And a lot of what we do is really sitting down there and creating boundaries for ourselves and understanding that in all spiritual communication you know, situations, we're in total control. Mm -hmm. You've got to be in control. And if you're not in control, that's where things get dicey. That's where uh, I would say probably 90% of like the negative cases that I've worked, people have given up their control. People are, you know, people are beaten down and, and just beat up and they just can't take it no more. And they give over their control. And there's some nasty entities just because we pass on doesn't mean that we're going to change that much. And the essence of our personalities stay the same. So if you have some little nasty SOB on the other, you know, that, that died and he's a nasty SOB on the other side, he's going to come back at you. Mm -hmm. You know, if he can find somebody that he can beat up, he's going to try to do it. Sure. You know, and there's parasiticals out there and addictive spirits and, you know, deity spirits and all these other spirits that are out there that can go and trick you. It's like the, it's like the Zozo phenomenon. Zozo is the Eddie Haskell of, of Ouija boards, <laughs> you know, because Zozo comes in and it's like real nice and then gets kind of nasty and scary and you know if if you don't follow what it wants to do and uh so you you know people don't realize that you can just go and stop and walk away from it sure and that's sometimes what people have to do and that's what that's a lot of what i try to teach people is the you know you have to keep your power you have to keep set boundaries and you're in control mm -hmm. and use your common sense is the other side are, are the spirits aware of those who are aware of them, who are sensitive to them? Can they pick you out of a crowd and go, I know if I approach this person, uh, he's much more likely to sense me and see me than someone who is not? Yes, I believe that. Because we believe in the natural laws. And that's something that I mean, I, I'm coming to you as, as you know, I'm, I am not one of these people that are like, oh, 
you know, this book says the egg dropped and it didn't break. You know, I'm going to have to go and test it for myself. You know, I'm I'm one of those guys that, you know, I'm a blue collar guy and I come from that school of hard knocks, you know, sure. so I'm a little skeptical because I don't believe everything that everybody tells me. Yeah. But like attracts like, and that's probably one of the number one rules within the natural laws. So if you're if you're operating at a higher vibrational frequency than other people, I believe that the other side, because they're vibrational, their frequency, they can pick that up. So they're going to target you right out, which is another reason why that you have to really kind of, you know, when you're working with negative cases, you've got to see, you got to kind of realize and figure out if this person might be working at a higher level. Why are they, why are, why are these things coming at them? So you've got to be able to figure that out. Again, everything is to me is energy. Everything to me is frequency. Mm -hmm. So this way, you know, when I, th when you think of it in that way, everything kind of meshes together in the natural laws, like attracts like intent, wishes, uh, the intercession of saints. Uh, this is why a lot of the Santeria candles work. A lot of, you know, the craft people work within different sending out spell work and hexes and, and, you know, the, the voodoo people. I mean, it's all the same. It's mm -hmm. all the same. I would say almost 90% of his energy. Sure. Why, when you have a spirit that, that is out there, that is coming to you and and i and you're saying you have to set up your boundaries otherwise you could be overwhelmed essentially uh in a, in a more layman terms it's almost like you're the counter at the dmv and they're the the, the people, oh my god people waiting that is the best that's the best <laughs> analogy i have ever heard tony oh my god that's exactly i'm can i use that yes, because that is exactly yeah. what it's like yeah you are the person <laughs> they got their ticket and they are just waiting for you to call their numbers so they can come up and say I got this. Is that really what it's like when they're coming to you? Do they do they have a message every time that they're they're wanting you to convey? Are they just wanting some sort of, you know, interpersonal connection that 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 longing to be heard by another person? What is it when when you make that connection there with with a spirit on the other side? A good medium, a good psychic is focused. Mm -hmm. They're very focused. So they're looking for the strongest connection. They're looking for that strongest connection that's going to come through. Mm -hmm. However, when you're out in a, in a crowd, that's exactly what it's like. It's a th or you go in like your uh, like uh, like psychics and mediums will bird dog for paranormal teams. They'll go out and they'll find you know the strongest vibrational areas and that sort of thing. That's exactly what it's like, and you get bombarded bombarded and everybody doesn't have a message everybody just sometimes they just want to just pass through and say hi or or you know yeah. uh can you do you know can you help or do this or that and you know you've got to really set that tone you've got to be focused you've got to be able to only say this is all i'm accepting mm -hmm. because otherwise it'll 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 definitely give you a run for your money and there's and they will be there 24 7 man they will let you sleep They'll be with you won't be able to go to the bathroom by yourself because they are going to it's just going to be a constant barrage. And that's the problem with a lot of mediums, because they'll go into these locations, you know, a like haunted location or whatever. And they're getting a thousand and one things instead of concentrating on the strongest voice, the strongest vibration that's coming through. Mm -hmm. And they're missing sometimes the point, whereas and, and here's the other thing. Spirits will lie. Spirits will lie. You know, you, you can be working with either a tool of divination or you're doing mediumship, you're doing a seance, and you get a name come through. Well, here's the thing. Is it really that person? Is the message coming through from that person? Or is it just something that's pretending to be that person? So you have to try to go and ask the same question three times in different ways in order to get a verification that it truly is. See, I don't take spirit on spirits, you know, on, on spirits, you know, on, uh, uh, on, you know, recognizance. I don't, I don't buy that. I mean, I'm just gonna, I'm one of those people that I'm going to question it mm -hmm. because I know that spirit lies. And here's the thing. They might be there. They may not be like super negative. They may not be negative at all, but they want to, they want that two way interaction. So sometimes they'll just jump in sure. and, a lot of times when you get something like that that just jumps in, you sit there and go, well, this isn't making sense. Mm -hmm. And then you realize what's going on where it's just trying to get open that, you know, open that two-way communication. And it's like seance or, you know, people come in and say, listen, I really would love to try to get a hold of this person. That's not always possible. 
Yeah. Not always possible because sometimes that other – the essence of that other person may not really want to talk to you or may be you know, busy helping, let's say, someone who has an addiction problem or, or is going through something, you know, getting ready to pass or whatever. They may not be there. But you know, some other spirit may do it and they may grab that name or they may grab that – you know, the identifiers or whatever and come in. And that's up to you to be able to go and – and try to sort that all out to see if it's mm-hmm. true or not. It, it's very much a, a human way of thinking. Uh, and I think that's something that we overlook sometimes with, with spirits or ghosts is we, we assign this whole other realm of, of superpowers or rules of honesty that, <laughs> that they don't have to abide by. Just as we didn't when we were alive, people will lie. They'll make things up if it's convenient and it makes sense at that moment and in time. So, of course, they're still going to do it at that moment. And then sometimes if the answer is not exactly what we think it should be, uh, then a lot of times the word demon gets dropped and, oh, well, oh my it, gosh, it, yeah. it, it said it was Uncle S- or Uncle Sam and, and it turns out it's not Uncle Sam, so it must be a demon. It's like, no, it actually was Bill down the road who died in the car accident who happens to be hanging around <laughs> here uh, because yes, Sam's exactly busy. And, and he happened to be in the room when we were calling and said, well, I'm around. I'll say I'm Sam, and then I can get that that enjoyment. I can I can have that moment of conversation because they're asking for it, and I'm the only one here at that moment in time. That wraps up the first part of our compelling conversation with Timothy Shaw. In part two, we'll ask, is the other side aware of those who are aware of them on the living side? Are spirits always seeking sensitive living messengers to convey their messages? The idea of spirits roaming the planet often contradicts the religious belief of an immediate transition into a heaven or to a hell. What does Tim believe about this process? And does Tim believe that a living person's own energy can in fact be responsible for paranormal activity, essentially the living haunting the living? All of that and more in the second part of our conversation with Timothy Shaw. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at The Grave Talks and me personally at Tony Bruski. That's Tony, B-R-U-E-S-K-I. For The Grave Talks, thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.